1954, I decided to spend the fall semester of my senior year at Swarthmore in the Washington semester program at American University in D.C. Great time to be down there. McCarthy was being censured. We were all in the gallery in the Senate that night when he got censured. And I was in Constitution Hall the night before when there was a huge rally for McCarthy with all these people coming in from around the country. It's the closest thing to a fascist rally I've ever been to. Um, but in 1954, my friends, the nation's capital was as segregated as Johannesburg, South Africa. We were running around the world telling folks to join us against godless communism, join the free world, right? We were the leaders of the free world. Not in D.C. And not in most other places in the United States. Everything was segregated, except that they had finally decided to allow African Americans to sit anywhere they wanted to in the buses. They, too, had been segregated. And I think many of you know that if people were on a train, African Americans were on a train heading south, as soon as they hit Virginia, they had to go into another car and all that kind of unbelievable stuff. Um, I was drafted into the Army in 1955 when I finished at Swarthmore, and uh, the desegregation of the armed forces in the United States was only beginning to be implemented. And, of course, that desegregation was ordered by the President of the United States, Harry Truman, from Missouri, a product of a segregated society and segregated schools. And um, it took a while to implement it. All of the generals said, don't do it. It's going to affect morale. It's going to affect all this stuff, right? Why did Harry Truman, a product of a segregated society, become the first civil rights president of the United States. Not FDR, by the way. Not FDR. The big champion of civil rights in the Roosevelt administration was Eleanor. And the Southerners hated her. But it was Truman. His product of segregated Missouri. How did it happen? What do you think? Any idea? Truman had served with distinction as an officer in World War I. He was a captain in the Missouri National Guard, which went to Europe and fought. And uh, apparently was an excellent officer. His men really revered him. But he was very proud of that service, very proud of his military service. And when our troops began being demobilized in 1945, the African-American troops, all of whom had served in segregated units, were being discharged, in many cases, in the South at Major. And there was one African-American, I think it was a sergeant, who had been discharged in Georgia, I believe. He got on a bus to come north, because he was coming home, I think to Philadelphia or some one of the northern cities. And a bunch of white guys pulled him off the bus and almost beat him to death in North Carolina at a bus stop. And Truman was outraged. Outraged. He was a guy who had put his life on the line for the United States. He had served proudly in the military. And that was the reception that greeted him when he came back. And so Harry Truman, folks, in 1946, created the first Civil Rights Commission. And in effect said to them, I want you to look at this situation and come back with a set of recommendations. Every one of his political advisors said, don't do it. Why not? Because he was perceived to be in big trouble politically. You know, this haberdasher from Kansas City trying to succeed FDR, couldn't fill those shoes and all this kind of stuff. Truman said, I'm doing it. And it was that Civil Rights Commission that came in with the first really sweeping recommendations for change. And lo and behold, he was the only guy who thought he could win. Harry Truman was reelected in 1948. You know, a really gutsy guy. I said to uh, Barry that I'm sorry I didn't think about it because I would have loved to have had you see one other film clip, which I showed to my students in California when 
Kitty and I take a brief trip out there for three months in the wintertime, as many of you know. It's tough. Somebody's got to do it. I mean, we leave right after Christmas. We don't come back till April. And we think about all of you, especially this past winter. Um, we thought of you. <laughs> and it's of Ron Dellums, the congressman from Oakland, speaking on the floor of the House on a bill to try to provide some compensation to Japanese Americans who were incarcerated in what we call relocation centers. They were concentration camps, folks. And telling about how he, as a six-year-old, stood helplessly on the sidewalk in Oakland while his best friend, Roland, a six-year-old Japanese-American kid, was put on a truck with his family and left that neighborhood screaming because he was taken away from his best friend, Ron, to those camps. I mean, it's almost as powerful as this. And I don't know how you felt about this one, but I get very emotional. And how many times have we heard Dr. King, and I have the same reaction to Dellums. So this interesting kind of romantic story you're hearing about, about the golden years of the 1950s, folks, and how it was a very special time, and, you know, the best generation and all this kind of stuff. No, no, nothing against the folks that fought for us in World War II, but, you know, it was a terrible period for all of us, really. In the 1940s, during the Holocaust, Jewish kids on Blue Hill Avenue were regularly beaten up by Irish kids. Every day. Every day. In Boston. And it wasn't this, this town was just racist. It was anti-Semitic. In fact, I don't think I mentioned this to you, but we have a terrific tennis playing grandson in Denver, who, by the way, with his father, just won the father-son tennis championship in the state of Colorado. And they come to Longwood to play in the National Father and Sons Tournament. And uh, Kitty was trying to explain to him that back when she was his age, she couldn't step foot in the Longwood Cricket Club because she was Jewish. And Nico just could not understand this. I mean, why would that make a difference? Happened all the time, folks. In fact, when I ran for the legislature in 1962 and got elected, thanks to the people of Brookline, many of whom, by the way, thought I was Jewish. <laughs> I'll never forget, I was, you know, I was campaigning hard, door to door, and I found myself near Washington Square on Beacon Street. It was a Sunday, I'll never forget it. I was campaigning there. And uh, an elderly woman was coming up the street. And, you know, when you get into that campaign mode, you'll shake hands with a fire hydrant or anything. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, he came up with a heavy Eastern European accent. And I said, hi, ma'am. I'm Mike Dukakis. I'm running for state representative. I'd like you to take one of my cards. Hope you'll support me. She said, don't worry. I always vote for the Jewish candidates. Well, even then, I had a reputation for a certain amount of integrity, and I really just couldn't leave her with this impression. So I said to her, uh, I said, well, um, I'm Greek myself, but I'm married to a Jewish girl. She said, you are? I mean, in horror, you know. Uh, uh, a mixed marriage, and by the way, they weren't very frequent in those days. You know, Jew-Gentile, forget about interracial. And uh, I came home and was telling Kitty the story, and she said, well, what'd you say to her? I said, nothing. I said, I figured I'd better get out, get out of there before she asked me what we were going to do about the kids. <laughs> but folks, that was the world we grew up in around here. Brookline High School was divided right down the middle. middle. Jewish kids on this side, mostly Catholic kids on this side. And then there were a small group of us that seemed to be able to move fairly easily back and forth between the two groups. I was one of them. Kitty was another. 
Why Kitty? Well, it turned out she didn't know this at the time, but she's a quarter Irish. That's a whole other story, which we won't get into tonight. But you just, when you live through that, and this is in Boston, folks, right? And of course, African Americans couldn't live on this side of the railroad tracks. They might work over here, but they had to go back over there. I think I may have mentioned to you. Uh, the only African American families, with one exception, that lived in the town of Brookline, there were two of them, were janitors. That was it, living in the basement. The only other African American family was the family of Roland Hayes, the great, great tenor. And there's an interesting story that I won't tell you about how he managed somehow to buy a house on Pill Hill in Brookline. Inconceivable. Except that he had sung at this home and had been welcomed into the home by the owner, who was an old Brahmin Yankee, and who died. His daughter had moved to California. Roland wrote her and said, do you think it might be possible for me to purchase your dad's house? She wrote back and said, I, think, I don't think my father could imagine anybody better than you. You could buy the house. But that was, folks, revolutionary. Imagine, in Brookline. Of course, in those days, it was five to one Republican, literally. And quite frankly, when I ran the legislation in 62, uh, it was inconceivable that a Greek American could be elected governor of the state. Not that people didn't like us. I mean, you know, they're not, they're not enough Greeks to threaten anybody. Um, <laughs> But it just, the ethnic politics of the time, even in this state, just, I mean, I had Greece coming up to me and saying, thanks for doing what you're doing. You're paving the way for my, you, you know, you can't win for state white office, but you're paving the way for my kids. 20 years later, I was in the governor's office. Paul Sangos was the United States Senator. And Nick Mervoulos was a congressman from the North Shore. All of us sons of immigrants. And of course, we've had an African-American governor not to mention an African-American president. So when people tell you about how wonderful it was back there, just tell them there was nothing wonderful about it. And of course, it was these gutsy kids sitting in at lunch counters and risking their lives and doing all of this stuff that paved the way for the rest of us. And by the way, a whole series of reform movements, folks, that tried to reform the prisons, tried to reform our mental hospitals, all triggered and inspired by the Civil Rights Movement. And many of them repeatedly going into federal courts primarily and arguing that the conditions that they were dealing with were unconstitutional under federal law. A very novel doctrine at the time. Who paved the way for that? Those kids at the lunch counters. Those kids marching. So these days we are very much in their debt, and I don't have to tell you the battle continues. I mean, we've we've been seeing the worst side of police community relations over the course of the past year or two. And by the way, that's been going on since the beginning of time. Except in the old days, they took them in the back of the police station and beat them up. And the interesting thing about it, folks, is that we now are learning a lot more about this because of a piece of new technology. Amazing. And I don't know how many of you saw Yvonne Abraham's column the other day about an altercation on a bus in Roxbury involving a young woman who apparently had some problems and who a T police officer thought had something from a sidewalk vendor and a T police officer who I believe was Haitian American. At least it sounded like that from his name. In which the police officer, I think, overreacted, although, and how at least 11 people whipped out their iPhones on the bus <laughs> and started recording this. <laughs> so there wasn't any ambiguity when the dispute, very interesting, very interesting. This little piece of technology that's out telling us things that a lot of us didn't know. In any event, um, that's just a little background for you. And um, 
the battle continues, needless to say, but it really began in the 60s. And uh, my two colleagues here, uh, both of whom I love dearly and I've known for a long time, were in the middle of that fight. And they got to talk about that. Ted Landsberg was a young associate in my law firm. Were you there when Well was there? Or did he come later? So, when he came back, he came. yeah, I, uh, I had to supervise these young associates. And I used to say when Well became governor, where did I go wrong? What? You know, where? <laughs> well, these days we're collaborating on what? Harbor Islands and the North South Railing. So, uh, you know, and Ted was one of those young associates. And then went on to do a whole bunch of other things, including, by the way, uh, the leadership of the Boston Architectural Center, which he really transformed into an excellent educational institution, but was deeply involved and at the risk of his life at one point during our troubles here in Boston. And Margaret, who I think was what? Were you 18, 19, or 20 when I first appointed you? You were very young. Um, I named the bench. She had only had five or six years of legal experience, and there was a lot of stuff about, well, she wasn't qualified. And she let her wait another five or ten years, and I don't think she was prepared to wait, and I wasn't prepared to wait, and did a great job for us. Now teaches at Northeastern Law School and teaches a lot around this set of issues. Now, I think you we will uh, talk a little bit uh, anecdotally about our uh, personal experiences in the context of uh, civil rights movement of the 60s. But what's really important to us is the question of what it is we've learned um, and how what it is we've learned is applicable uh, to what is going on today. Uh, because uh, reminiscences are fine, uh, but uh, as a well-known American poet once said, the past is a bucket of ashes. Um, unless you learn something from it and uh, apply it to uh, contemporary life. Um, how do I advance this, incidentally? Where is my tech person? Arrow down. Arrow down. Oh, on this one. OK, good. So we're going to start, or at least I'm going to start, by asking a few questions uh, that we're going to ask you to consider uh, before we get into uh, what we hope will be a very uh, rich and meaningful dialogue. The first of those is how important and in what forms are formal organizational structures needed uh, to achieve socially based outcomes? Uh, do we need formal structures to make stuff happen? Uh, second question is what is uh, the process that we need to think about for defining those specific achievable outcomes and what should those civil and human rights outcomes be today? Um, we know that many conditions of social and economic equity uh, in Boston and throughout the United States are actually worse today than they were during the civil rights era of the 60s. Statistically, for example, um, there's a clear understanding that uh, income uh, inequalities are greater now than they were during the 60s. So the question that raises is, uh, what are the most effective ways of our articulating and achieving strategies for reversing that trend? And I raise that because you know, we did a whole lot of work in the 60s in civil rights, and uh, it's a little frustrating to um, find ourselves a half century later worse off in many respects than we were then. And then the final question that has to be raised, particularly for this group, um, given uh, the way uh, a number of you have answered questions about our demographics, who we are, um, and, and where we're going, um, at this moment is um, what role should participants in the civil rights structure uh, struggles of the 60s play in achieving social and economic justice today? 
And I'll leave that question up there because it is for me the nagging question. Um, again, uh, we'll talk a little bit about history, uh, but um, what we really need to talk about is what it is we're doing today. Um, I have developed a list, and on one level it will seem boring. It's a list of dates and activities, but as I was doing a little bit of research for uh, this talk, um, I found myself actually being a little bit amazed and discombobulated by what I realized were uh, my own distorted senses of the sequences of events uh, during the civil rights period. Um, so I'm going to start, as I think Margaret will as well, and, and take note of the fact that the civil rights era did not start in the 60s. Um, and I will reference what uh, Michael said uh, to a large extent when uh, American soldiers came back from the Second World War and found that they were still being discriminated against, uh, there was a sense of national outrage that people had gone and fought valiantly and died and then returned to segregated conditions in the United States. So in 1948, uh, Truman signed an executive order that barred racial discrimination in the armed forces. And uh, as Michael noted, it wasn't until about 1955 uh, that uh, the armed forces could actually say that uh, desegregation within the armed forces had occurred. In 1948, Shelley versus Kramer, a major uh, legal uh, decision came out of the Supreme Court uh, that barred racially restrictive covenants that excluded people of color from purchasing homes in white communities. Yes, it was a matter of law that you could write into uh, a covenant uh, when you were selling a piece of real estate, as Michael pointed out uh, in Brookline, you could just say, uh, we're not going to sell to blacks or Latinos, mostly blacks. Um, and it wasn't until 1948 that the Supreme Court addressed and uh, eliminated the ability to write in those restrictions. 1954 uh, is the date of Brown versus Board of Education. And I, I need to uh, interrupt myself here by saying that uh, last week I had a conversation with uh, one of the folks who was in the audience here who said that it was also around that time that as far as he was concerned, the key moment in 60s civil rights history occurred. And that was the moment when Martin Luther King, having completed his studies in theology uh, at Boston University and having met Coretta um, and knowing that his future was ahead of him, made the decision to move back south rather than staying here in the north where he could have had a perfectly comfortable life as a minister. But instead, he decided to go home. How different would the civil rights era have been had he stayed here in New England. But in 1954, Brown versus Board of Education came down. And one of the things that always amazed me about that decision was that we think about it in relation to uh, bringing young people together um, and overcoming uh, racial injustice in schools, but very few people know or remember that that case was actually uh, a compilation of several cases that came from around the country. And from my perspective, the most interesting of those cases was a case that came out of Washington, D.C., where an individual, a father, wanted to enroll his daughter in a different but still segregated black school in Washington. He was very dark. And all of the students in the school that he wanted to enroll his African-American daughter in were African-Americans who were very light. And so his daughter was excluded from that school because she wasn't light enough. And so he filed a lawsuit. And there was a lot of social science research that was done by Dr. Kenneth Clark in New York uh, describing the uh, way it was that uh, young African Americans were assimilating the values of whites and discriminating as among ourselves. And it was that case, as much as any other case, that was persuasive of the Supreme Court to the extent that the court said, 
once people are discriminating against themselves on the basis of skin color, we've really gone too far in this country. And Brown was passed. Now, I was among the first four young African Americans in New York City to be bused. In the year after Brown, uh, the New York City public school system made a determination that they wanted to see what the possible consequences might be of taking four young black kids out of schools in Harlem and putting us in schools in a primarily white area, Upper Manhattan, primarily Jewish schools. And so the four of us were put on public buses every day, and this was in the fourth grade, and we were bused back and forth on public transportation. And then we were tested over a period of time. We were each uh, the only black kids in our, again, primarily white classes. And by the time we got to middle school, the feeling was that this was probably a good thing. But my own experience of busing, which came back to haunt me years later, uh, was one of being one of those very first and finding myself as the only dark face in a class of white kids. And interestingly for me, it wasn't until I got to high school where there was one other black kid in my class, and I looked across the room, I said, oh my God, there's a black kid in this class. <laughs> that I realized how strange I must have seemed to many of my classmates in elementary school. In 1955, sit-ins were begun in the South by the Congress of Racial Equality, Corps, and they started up in Baltimore, the NAACP at that point uh, won a legal suit that forced the University of Alabama to admit a young woman named Authorine Lucy, who was later kicked out. In August of that year, a teenager named Emmett Till apparently looked at a white woman uh, in the wrong way. Uh, he was pulled out, murdered, brutalized, mutilated in Mississippi, and the Emmett Till murder was one that achieved national prominence and headlines because Americans at that point were just so disgusted. And his mother held an open casket funeral for him so that everyone could see how brutally he had been beat it, beaten. That was also the year that Martin Luther King's house was bombed. Two years later, or a year later, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference was created. A group of ministers came together. In 57, schools were segregated in Little Rock. Governor Orville Faubus stood on the steps of uh, the uh, State House and uh, resisted integration. And later that year, uh, President Eisenhower signed a Civil Rights Act. So prior to the 60s, there was all kinds of activity going on, mostly in the nature of litigation, and in the start of a series of activities uh, that uh, led to freedom rides and sit-ins, which began in Greensboro in 1960. In 1960 as well, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC, was created. And in 61, the following year, Freedom rides began across the South, and you saw some images of buses that um, were full of uh, folks from around the country, some of which buses were burned. It was in that year that President Kennedy signed Executive Order 10925 that created the Equal Employment Opportunity Committee. And it was that group that made the first reference to affirmative action. The following year, in 62, James Meredith enrolled at the University of Mississippi. In 63, the SCLC began a series of nonviolent protests, and Bull Connor used fire horse, uh, hoses to disperse demonstrators, and you saw some of those images. 63 was also the year of the initiation of the Mississippi Freedom Summer, which was a student driven voter education and registration project. And it was at that 
point that Medgar Evers, one of the leaders um, in the civil rights movement in the South, was killed outside of his home in Jackson, Mississippi. It was the same year, 1963, that the Children's Crusade started. And in August of that year, Martin Luther King, assuming a role, a leadership role with the SCLC, helped to organize with others, Bayard Rustin and uh, a number of ministers, the March on Washington. Now, I, I get anecdotal here because um, I was uh, heavily involved with my church in New York. And uh, in those days, churches were actively engaged, as they are today, in social action. And my church organized uh, a set of bus rides, um, rented buses, and we paid whatever the cost was to uh, get a bus ride south. Um, and uh, unfortunately, or fortunately for me, uh, we got caught in very heavy traffic somewhere along the uh, New Jersey Turnpike and ended up getting to the March on Washington late. And uh, because there were so many buses parked where the buses were supposed to park, our bus drove us uh, right up to the memorial and let us out. And uh, I ended up 50 feet from Dr. King underneath the speech, and that was, for me, a highly transformative moment. It was that same year that the 24th Amendment, banning the poll tax, was ratified. In September of that year in Birmingham, a church was bombed, and four young girls were killed there. In November of that year, uh, JFK was assassinated. Uh, 63 was an extraordinary year as a startup year for a lot of very intense civil rights activities. The following June, in response to much of what had happened before, uh, the Freedom Rides continued, and it was in June of that year, three civil rights workers, uh, Cheney, Schwerner, and Goodman, were killed in Philadelphia, Mississippi, in July of that year, LBJ signed the Civil Rights Act of 1964. In August of that year, uh, at the Democratic National Convention, the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party appeared demanding that uh, a, uh, an integrated uh, group of delegates be seated rather than having the uh, traditional white group seated. And in December of that year, Martin Luther King became the youngest person to be awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. Three months later, in February of 65, Malcolm X, who had been uh, a very vocal uh, leader uh, of uh, uh, the uh, black Muslims, was assassinated in New York. In March of that year, the Selma March uh, took place in Alabama, and here again I feel a little bit like Zadig. Um, I was then uh, an undergraduate at Yale, a sophomore, um, and uh, a number of us knew that the Selma March was going on, and that it was important for us to try to be there, uh, and someone had put a sign up um, at Dwight Hall, which was a social service agency that um, got young people out into communities saying that uh, there were a group of uh, divinity school students uh, who wanted to drive to Selma, Alabama, and they were looking for riders to share the cost. And so I made the phone call, and uh, we agreed that we would uh, take off that night and, and head down to Selma. I don't think that they expected that they would be riding with someone black. So when I showed up, there was a little bit of shock, and we had a brief conversation, and then they had a brief conversation, and then they came back and they said, you know, we're, we're divinity students, and uh, we have to stand for what it is we say we believe in. And so I curled up in the back of their Chevy or Dodge or whatever it is, and we took off and headed south. And once we got down to uh, Alabama, uh, we had a couple of very interesting confrontations. Uh, one was in a small rural town uh, where we entered. We'd been driving all night, and we uh, went into a little luncheonette to try to get some coffee. Um, and needless to say, uh, we couldn't be served. And we sat 
and we sat, and then we talked among ourselves about what it would mean for us to just get up and leave. And finally, a waitress, white waitress, of course, came up to us, and she leaned over the counter, and she was crying. And she said, you know, boys, I'd like to serve you, but I just can't. Would you please leave? And so dutifully, we got up, three white seminarians and myself, and we got back in the car, and we drove out of town. And as we drove out of town, sure enough, there was a pickup truck that followed us out of town and to the limits of that town. And then we went on our way, and we were terrified. And when we finally got to Selma, it turned out that uh, we were kind of too young and we were northerners and what have you. So we didn't really get to march. What we got to do was all of the background support work, making phone calls and licking envelopes and, you know, all this stuff that doesn't show up in all of the pictures that, you know, enable you to feel very heroic about having taken part in that kind of activity. And that evening, each one of us was put in the home of a, a family in Selma, and we had been warned that we were not to be found out late at night uh, because it was dangerous for us. And I was uh, put up in the home of a, a very generous uh, black family. And needless to say, on the way back from uh, the meetings we were holding and the work we were doing, I got lost. And in those days, the black community lived primarily in shanties. There were no sidewalks, no street signs, and no street lights. And I had to find my way back to where I was staying. And I was alone, which of course I shouldn't have been. And I saw about a quarter of a mile down the street, a pickup truck with its lights on just cruising very slowly. And I'd been told that night riders were out and that uh, if they caught any of us, they'd probably kill us. And so I was grateful to find a very high hedge and I spent the night underneath that hedge, creating all kinds of anxieties for my hosts, who of course wanted to know where I was. We didn't have cell phones, of course, in those days, so I couldn't very well call anyone. And I got back, and the thing I learned was that all of us were, in fact, risking our lives to be down there because it was only the next day that Viola Liuzzo from Detroit, uh, a homemaker who uh, was white and was a marcher, was shot and killed. And then I went back to being a college student. So in March of that year, 65, the Selma March took place. You've seen pictures of it. The EEOC began its work that year. The Voting Rights Act of 1965 was passed in that year. That was also the point in time when Watts exploded in civil disturbances. LBJ assigned Executive Order 11246, which authorized legally affirmative action. And then the following year, the Black Panther Party was found, founded. The following year was the year when the National Organization of Women was founded. Uh, Stokely Carmichael in 1966 coined the term Black Power, which led in part, some say, to the division of the organized forces that were working together around civil rights. The following year, MLK's Beyond Vietnam speech further alienated uh, the civil rights movement, which tended to stand against the war from many of its supporters. Civil disturbances took place in Detroit, 43 people died. Muhammad Ali was stripped of his heavyweight title uh, because as a conscientious objector, he felt that he should not have to go and fight in the war. It was not until 1967 
that the Supreme Court ruled in Loving versus Virginia that you couldn't ban interracial marriages in this country. The Age Discrimination Act was enacted in 1967. In 68, LBJ declares a war on poverty. The Kerner Commission comes out with its report indicating that America is moving towards two societies, one black, one white. That was in response to the disturbances in Detroit. Martin Luther King was shot and killed in April of 68. 124 cities had riots immediately thereafter. The Civil Rights Act of 1968 was then passed. The Poor People's Campaign set up on the National Mall in Washington, D.C. People were camping out on the mall in the same way that they had camped out after the First World War. By June of 68, Robert Kennedy had been shot and killed. The American Indian Movement was founded that year. Richard Nixon was elected. The following year, Stonewall took place in New York and the gay rights movement, drawing upon some of the things that had been learned from the civil rights movement, came into prominence. And finally, in 71, Swan versus Charlotte Mecklenburg upheld, uh, upheld busing as a legitimate way of achieving integration in public schools. And then a whole bunch of things happened after that, which we don't need to go into. Some people say that what was learned in the civil rights movement concerning racial justice was then transferred to the women's movement and the gay rights movement and the American Indian movement and a range of other uh, movements that were designed to achieve social justice. The question is, what do we learn from all that, particularly given that so many of our economic and social indicators are worse today than they were then? What is it that those of us who went through that period and achieved certain pieces of legislation and, and social justice, what is it that we need to do today? And in particular, what is it that we need to do in Massachusetts? Because as much as we feel satisfied, about the fact that Deval Patrick uh, was elected governor and re-elected, since the beginning of the Commonwealth, there have been only 93 women of color who've been elected to the Massachusetts legislature. That goes back to the 18th century. And Boston remains the only major city in the United States that has not yet elected either a woman or a person of color to be mayor. So how self-satisfied should we feel? And what is it that we need to do today to continue to move forward with issues of social justice? So let me now turn this over to Margaret, who will uh, bring up certain larger conceptual issues. Margaret, you're on. Historians have a different way of thinking about the civil rights movement and what they thought about it has changed over time. So their first impressions, uh, the first kind of history that we got from people like Taylor Branch and uh, other journalists who wrote about the movement uh, sounded very much like uh, the events that uh, Ted described. Uh, it's a movement that starts in 1954 with Brown versus Board of Education. Uh, and it ends when Martin Luther King is killed in 1968. Um, so that's considered the sort of master narrative classic civil rights movement from 1954 to 1968. Um, the other thing that historians early on in their uh, review of the movement and thinking about the movement was, uh, was that uh, they said, okay, uh, the Lord, you know, it's, it's characterized by these character, uh, these charismatic larger-than-life leaders, and we know who they are, we heard one of them uh, today, uh, and it was the force of their personality and of their ideas which catapulted the movement, uh, which ultimately was, of course, the uh, most important uh, social justice movement in the 20th century in our country, but it was these leaders, and by, by the way, most of them in this early view of the movement were, in fact, male. Uh, it was characterized by a philosophy uh, of nonviolence, and uh, we always think about King and associate him 
his views as CLC with this uh, perspective, the nonviolent perspectively perspective. It was mostly a southern movement, uh, and it was marked by place. And uh, Ted has told us about some of those places: Selma, Alabama, Birmingham, Alabama, Montgomery, Alabama, Albany, Georgia, uh, the Delta area, Jackson, Mississippi, Neshoba, where the um, three civil rights workers were killed in that. 1964, um, Muddy, Mississippi, where Emmett Till was killed. So it's characterized, so we understand the movement uh, uh, through our understanding of place and our understanding of characters in these particular venues, like, for example, Bull Connor of uh, Birmingham uh, or the mayor of, of Selma. Um, so uh, again, it's a southern movement. Uh, and uh, and its product, what did it produce? What changed as a result of the movement? And of course, the concrete changes are those that we see at the national level when we talk about the, uh, the historic adoption in 1964 of the first major piece of civil rights legislation in the United States. Uh, there was a Civil Rights Act in 1957, uh, but between uh, 1865, 1870, uh, when the Civil Rights Act, uh, Post-Civil uh, post War Act were adopted, there was this huge lacuna, this huge space when nothing happened until 18, 1957 when you get this rather pale civil rights uh, legislation. And then LBJ comes in and he uh, picks up on the, uh, on the energy and the, and the demands of the movement and we get the 1964, uh, his, his historic 1964 legislation, and then after it, um, the 1965 Burning Rights Act. Um, so that was the first view of what the movement looks like. And then historians begin to complicate the situation. Uh, they begin to say, well, actually, let's take a closer look at, first of all, what was going on in national politics and what, was its, what impact did that have on the stuff going on in the South. Uh, what was going on internationally? How did the, McCarthy, the era of McCarthyism affect uh, what was going on in the South? They begin to look not just at the role of these large uh, figures like uh, King and Shuttlesworth uh, and Bob Moses, but they also begin to look at the role of women. Right? Uh, and they uncover, for example, um, the, uh, the role of people like, uh, the, the long uh, role history of uh, people like, um, like, uh, like, like, like uh, Rosa Parks, uh, Fannie Lou Hamer, uh, and other uh, theorists uh, of the movement uh, who, uh, Ella Baker, people who essentially helped young people uh, understand what it meant to be engaged, to be in movement. Um, and they also, then a book was written by a, a fellow by the name of uh, John Dittmer called Local People. And that focused not so much on what was going on um, at, the, at the top level, you know, at a sort of, sort of the top down view of the movement, but really a bottom up. Okay? So how are these communities becoming engaged? Who is it within these communities um, that are in motion? Uh, that are on these marches, that are take, letting their children uh, go out and march and get hit uh, by um, hit by uh, by uh, by, uh, by um, hoses, right? Uh, and as I said, they look at the national uh, impact of the movement. They look at begin to look uh, see it as a movement that yes is multiracial, does involve uh, folks who are coming down from the north, like the Yale Divinity School students, but really is mostly. Uh, uh, rooted in uh, the African American community. The, the leadership is mostly rooted in local African American communities. Uh, and as I said, they begin to look at communities, you know, a lot of community studies come out of this period. People begin to look at, okay, what happened in Greenwood, Mississippi in, 19, in the 1950s? What really happened in Albany, uh, Albany Georgia? Um, during this period of time. So you get these local studies um, that begin to influence the way we uh, work with the movement. And then about 15 years ago, a woman by the name of Jacqueline Dow, a historian by the name of Jacqueline Dow, uh, wrote a very influential article called The Long Civil Rights Movement. Uh, and what Jacqueline Dow said is that periodicity that historians have usually uh, used to define what we know as the Civil Rights Movement, i.e. 1954 to 1968, 
leaves off a lot of history, right? So that there's more continuity than discontinuity. So if we look back at what happened before 1954, before Brown and Board of Education, uh, Dowd and others began to say, um, as uh, Governor Dukakis and Tanner remarked, um, that really we need to look at what was going on in the night. To fully understand the 50s, you have to understand uh, the connections between the 50s and the night, the 50s and the 40s, and indeed the 30s. You have to look at the labor movement. You have to look at sort of the radical demands that labor was making and the efforts that labor was uh, and the insistence of labor that it be a uh, a, a biracial movement where uh, black freedom demands uh, could be partnered uh, with the demands of labor. Um, you have to look uh, not only uh, you have to look at the popular front <coughs> movement, which was basically uh, a movement of socialists and communists coming out of the New Deal period and moving into the 1930s and the 1940s, and what their contribution uh, was in the 1940s to radicalizing views of what the United States ought to look like uh, in uh, in uh, in the South. Uh, and then you know you have to take another look. At these figures who are, you know arise almost out of the ether in the sort of mass narrative theory of the civil rights movement, they come out of nowhere. Rosa Parks all of a sudden got tired, and oh wow, let me sit down in the front of the bus um, and uh, see what happens. No, 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 no. Rosa Parks was a student at the Highlander School in the 1940s. She was involved in activities in her community, in that Montgomery community. For years, when she sat down in the front of the bus, there was a cameraman right there, right? So this was an act of resistance. God bless her, right? Uh, but it was, a, but it, but it, but it was an intentional act of, of resistance coming from a woman who was schooled in uh, civil rights activism and had been from the 1940s. Same with Brian Weston, right? Does he just all of a sudden? Uh, appear in 1962 and say, oh, we need a march on Washington, let me put one together, and then you come to August 1963, the march on Washington? No. Brian Weston comes out of a conscientious objector movement in the 1940s. He was himself a conscientious objector and went to jail. Um, so he too has these, these folks have these long trajectories of associations with a movement that in fact was interrupted by the period, by the uh, McCarthy uh, period of McCarthy's an anti-communist period in our country. The Wallace campaign, same time as the um, as the uh, Truman election in 1948. Now Wallace loses. He loses. Comes in fourth, uh, by, dead last. Uh, but he begins to raise on a national scene uh, issues uh, having to do with um, justice uh, in the South, and he really, you know, he paves the way for. Uh, oh, he begins to, he's the radical voice of what ultimately be, appears in the Truman uh, campaigns of 1948. Uh, we also begin to look, take a look at the NAACP. So, Brown v. Board, did that come out of nowhere? It came out of a whole series of uh, anti discrimination <coughs> litigation undertaken by the NAACP in a very systemic, uh, intentional way all across the 1940s. So that has to be seen as in some sense part of this 54 to 68 movement. Uh, and again, we look at the role of women, uh, that women were very active, uh, and we look to at the uh, what was going on internationally with uh, the uh, movements against colonialism and think about what their relationship was uh, to Worldwide new understandings of human rights coming out of World War II, uh, and new understandings of sort of like, you know human human rights, human identity, uh, and uh, and and uh, and fully what it takes fully to realize democracy. So okay, so then you have so you have that kind of enriching of the master narrative, uh, and then you have the long civil rights movement as reflected uh, mostly in the work of Jack Wendell. Now, Dow not only pushes the movement back in time, she says we really look, need to look at what's going on in the 30s, but she also says that 68 cutoff is arbitrary. Well, of course it's arbitrary, um, but that's what historians do. You know, they tell us, okay, this is the World War II period, and this is the Great Depression, so on and so forth. Uh, but she says that by cutting it off at that point, 
you lose certain connective tissue that helps you really understand what the thrust and import of the civil rights movement was. So as um, Ted said, the movements that emerged uh, out of the 19s, the ferment of the 1960s, the women's movement, uh, the movement for disability rights, ultimately the movement for um, the, uh, the LGBT movement, the movement for gay rights, um, all of these um, demands uh, that uh, become part of the American uh, political scene really uh, uh, come uh, really need to be understood as part of a longer civil rights movement is what Dow argues for. Okay, so yeah, pushing it back. Okay, so here we are. We're pushing it forward, pushing it beyond uh, 1968. Um, and as I've said, you know, you have the uh, women's movement, you have the anti-war movement, um, and also. What, comment, what historians have said is, in point of fact, the reality is that some movements didn't really take hold at all until late 19th, the late 1960s. So those movements uh, really have to be counted as part of the so-called long civil rights movement. Okay, so that's where we were until maybe about five years ago. And so now we have kind of a third view. We have first, the first view, which is the classic view, the main, the the the, uh, the, uh, the, the 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 master narrative view. We have the long civil rights movement, and now uh, other scholars, most importantly a fellow by the name of Steve Lawson, have begun to debate uh, Dow's long civil rights movement, um, and um, they have said um, that actually uh, you know, the long civil rights movement misses the sort of the dynamism and the unique quality uh, of, the, of the, the 54 to 68, the genius of the 54 to 68 um, period uh, by uh, taking us back in time and bringing us forward in time, uh, you're really missing kind of the essential quality of, of what the movement that brought the back of American, of American uh, apartheid. Now, new scholarship uh, on the civil rights movement this is kind of a third, the third generation scholarship. It takes a close look, for example, at the cultural um, uh, underpinnings and the cultural developments in the movement uh, and begins to see people uh, like Nina Simone and the Free Southern Theater coming out of New Orleans, that all of these are part of the movement that have uh, for a long time been ignored, uh, begins to look at uh, the role of women that women have historically played, and particularly African American women, have historically played in the struggle uh, against sexual uh, violence, and sees that as a part uh, of the movement. And then a film came out, I don't know how many of you saw it, but a really nice film came out just a couple of months ago about the women's movement that kind of recaps the women's movement, uh, and it too begins to highlight um, the role of African American women in. Uh, in, 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 the, in what was uh, mostly a white women's movement. Okay, so here we are, we're at the end. So how does it end? You know, uh, if it ended, it, 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 it did end, uh, although as Ted has pointed out, the sequel, the, not the sequel, but certainly um, the um, obstacles to full, a fully realizing our democracy that, it, that were the motivations for the impetus for the civil rights movement, uh, i.e., uh, disenfranchisement of African American voters, uh, the, you know, the uh, uh, mass incarceration, uh, the wealth gap, the education, the uh, wealth gap, the education gap. All of these things uh, are still uh, on our on our national and certainly our local agenda here in Boston. Uh, but you can say that the civil rights movement, the one we're talking about, the '60s movement really begins to end with a kind of a counterattack, counter a kind of pushback that is you know, fully uh, reflected, becomes fully reflected in during the Reagan era, when people begin to talk about, well, first of all, begin to talk, you know, colorblindness becomes, you know, the idea that, you know, the, the articulating sort of just straight up racist uh, understandings of you know social interactions, you know they're black and therefore they're bad. They're black and therefore they're criminal. Uh, those become uh, um, unacceptable after 19, say 1965. Uh, but they do become expressed in other ways. Um, so you know this whole notion that 
you know, that, uh, that we're, we all started at the same place and we all should make it to the same place. The idea of colorblindness uh, begins to, you know, influence the national policy, uh, become, begins to push back against uh, affirmative action policies. You have the transformation uh, by Reagan of uh, institutions uh, that were essential to fully carrying out the civil rights agenda of the 1960s, i.e. the war on poverty, the Great Society, um, the, the Voting Rights Act, uh, like the EEOC, all of those get peopled by uh, Reagan conservatives, uh, and they begin to, and then also you just have the attacks on, on, on the movement. Um, so in the anti-war movement, you have attacks on the anti-war movement, people get arrested, um, they get spied on, they get busted, um, and they begin to, uh, as a result of all these attacks, they begin um, to disintegrate. So, uh, to Ted's question, um, you know, where does this leave us? You know, uh, and what are they? So, what are the lines running from there to here? Well, certainly one line, consistent line, is disenfranchisement. So, you know, we've seen that across the 20th century, it was the major plank in the civil rights movement of 19, the 1954-68 movement, ended up in the Voting Rights Act, and we still have major efforts to keep black folk, to keep people of color from the polls. Why is that? Well, you know, it's simple math, folks. If you think about our country, it's probably equally divided between Republicans and Democrats. African Americans tend to vote Democratic. We know that, right? So if you have an equally divided electorate, the only way one party wins over the other party is if some people don't vote, right? And so, you know, the, the, so disenfranchisement is you know, a tactic, a long-standing, hundred-year-old tactic, right, to keep black folk uh, from the polls. Why did why did Obama win? In part because of that GOTV, right? What's GOTV? Get out the vote campaign. Did I say it right? GOTV. That's something different, isn't it? <laughs> What's GOTV? Okay. You guys know what I mean. Get out the vote, right? So you got this get out the vote campaign. Well, where does that come from? That comes from the 64, the movements of 1964, 1960. It's the same campaign, right? It's exactly the same campaign, and it addresses itself to the same phenomenon in American politics. So there's that. So there's, you know, as I said, as, um, as uh, Ted said a moment ago, if you look at the wealth gap in our city, our beautiful city of Boston, it's enormous. Uh, the Federal Reserve produced a report back in April in which they found that for every $250,000 in net wealth that Median that uh, median net worth well that whites have African the median net worth of African Americans is guess what eight dollars the median net worth of uh, Puerto Ricans is something like ten dollars the median net worth of people from DR zero a big fat zero as compared with two hundred fifty thousand dollars for uh, whites in the city of Boston. Uh, the crime, the disparities in crime, that's another talk. Uh, but all of these are um, certainly uh, alive. The notion that we are post-racial and that the election of the president reflects a kind of, you know, the icing on the cake of the civil rights movement, the final glory and triumph of the civil rights movement is reflected in the election of President Obama, right? Uh, and it's, and, you know, it's in, in, in some ways, uh, we have broken the back of the cruelest and most brutal forms of apartheid in our country, uh, but we're far from achieving the goals that were laid out in the civil rights movement, whether you date it from 1954, or whether you date it from the time uh, of, the, of the origins of the Black Freedom Movement in this country, which uh, start, you know, with resistance against slavery and uh, abolition, um, 
So, you get it? Yeah. All right. I'd like to ask both uh, Professor Burnham and uh, Professor Landsmark uh, to comment on the Black Lives Matter movement and how do you see that relating to the civil rights movement that we've just been talking about? Um, first of all, Black Lives Matter is uh, both a movement and an organization. And in that sense, it's very much like the movements and organizations that we had um, during the 1960s. Uh, so it's a network that started uh, after the murder of the fellow in, um, in uh, Florida over the um, candy. What the, what? Trayvon Martin. Trayvon, thank you, Trayvon Ma Martin. After the murder of um, Trayvon Martin, these uh, folks came together and they started a network. Uh, and the network has certain organizing principles and um, you know, that hold it together. The hashtag Black Lives Matter is a different matter. <laughs> uh, many people have taken on the mantle of Black Lives Matter and have associated themselves with the idea that Black Lives Matter. In that sense, it's like the Black Power uh, shout of uh, Stokely Carmichael that um, Ted referenced years ago. You know, to, uh, he says black power and everyone says, oh, that makes sense, black power, black power, black power. And so the Black Lives Matter hashtag, I think ha it resonates with that. Uh, it's a movement that, you know, it's today's movement. Uh, it's not a historical. It rests on what was done in earlier uh, generations. Uh, but like every movement, it has its own characteristics, its own, um, its own strategies, its own tactics, its own underlying, uh, you know, theories, uh, some of which could be criticized. Uh, you know, some might say, well, you know, what are their demands? You know, what do they want? Have they said what they want? Why don't they say what they want? Unless you say what you want, you put out some demands, you're not going to get anything. Uh, well, it's not just Black Lives Matter. All lives matter. Why are they insisting on Black Lives Matter? What are they doing bothering Bernie Sanders and Hillary Clinton? And what is it they want from them? Except, you know, so there's lots of critiques, but that's healthy. And that's what we expect to happen when folks take to the streets and begin to uh, organize. And you're going to get new people who had no association with the movement before. I went to one black lives. So I just have to tell one anecdote since both Mike and Ted have told theirs. Mine is a Black Lives Matter anecdote. I went to one meeting of uh, the group or of a number of the organizers across the country. And one young woman uh, from Ferguson talked about how uh, she's new to the movement, and she talked about how uh, black women, particularly older black women, these, this is a quote from her, older black women always want to come up to me and tell me about how it, what it was like back then. And she said, and then she next said, and this is when we all of us with a, of a certain age began to cringe, she said, I have a grandma. I don't need a new grandma. My grandma loves me. Please move. <laughs> so, what are you going to do? <laughs> uh, I, I think it's, um, I think the movement is um, a, a very important and healthy way of beginning to mobilize uh, people who uh, may not have been engaged in uh, civil action up to now, and it articulates an important value. Uh, and it emerges from uh, a resistance to centuries, really, of police brutality uh, and mistreatment. Um, but I don't think it goes far enough in terms of addressing all of the issues that need to be addressed at this moment. I mean, if we were in a position to uh, eliminate uh, the abuses of authority uh, that uh, generated uh, this particular movement, that would be a wonderful thing. I don't know that we'll see that in uh, this lifetime or our children's or the next one. But even assuming we had an impact on that, would that then also address the issues of income inequality? Would it address the issues of creating opportunity? There's a difference between redressing injustice at a level of abuse and looking forward to create opportunities that, in fact, uh, make that abuse unthinkable. 
um, and at least in terms of the articulation of the values that I've heard up to now, um, you know, I, I, it, it's a great start, uh, but it's, it's only one piece of the issue. The other thing I would note is that um, it's dealing with one issue, but as we saw from what happened in the 60s, uh, there were multiple groups operating at multiple levels uh, moving forward uh, not necessarily in lockstep, but dealing with a range of different issues. So SCLC and CORE and the NAACP and the Black Panther Party um, and uh, uh, you know, the Urban League and a range of other groups, each focused by and large on a segment of mobilization, litigation, uh, uh, fundraising, uh, uh, addressing uh, 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 corporate uh, injustices, labor, and a range of other things. And periodically they'd get together and talk to each other or fight with each other or do whatever, but it was more than one group just addressing uh, issues of, of uh, the value of human life. And uh, I think that uh, that's why I put this question up. I think that it's important uh, to prioritize a range of issues and put a whole bunch of people to work on a range of different issues um, in ways that uh, move something forward. Hi, my name's on. Hi, my name is Cayman. I am a fourth year international affairs and political science student here. I also run Democracy Matters, which is a campaign finance based group on campus. I'm involved in a number of uh, other groups as well. I do a lot of protesting. I lived in DC for a while as a protester as well for one of my co ops. If you all are familiar with the co op program here. My question for you is that I have been to another a number of Black Lives Matters protests. Um, I've, I've definitely participated in a number of events. Um, and one big question that comes up among activist circles um, is how to be uh, a good white a, a good white ally, um, and that is a huge question. And I was wondering if maybe you could draw from examples of how did whites fit in in the '60s, um, and how 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 were how were they able to be uh, allies uh, in in that movement, and how could we draw from that today? I think that's a great question, and, and it's a question that I hoped would come up. Um, the civil rights movement, as I experienced it, um, was one that drew upon the um, ethical and philosophical and uh, moral leadership uh, of a range of people who were sometimes but not always visible and who are often white, uh, ministers, college presidents, uh, faculty members, um, housewives like Viola Liuzzo, uh, people of conscience who cared about the issue and who stepped forward and who very often provided a kind of um, moral compass and moral and ethical guidance uh, to the groups that were then out on the streets. Um, I remember uh, uh, groups of us used to talk about not just the fact that folks were uh, fundraising and uh, uh, writing articles and uh, using journalistic skills and uh, uh, going on the media to provide added credibility for things that were going on. Um, the, the fact of the matter was that, that we could have conversations. Um, uh, deep, meaningful, ethical conversations about why we were doing what we were doing and why it was important. Um, when I was at Yale, for example, uh, the Reverend William Sloan Coffin uh, brought together a, a group of people. He called us deacons so that arguably we were all kind of related to some sort of uh, religious discussion, but on a weekly basis we would talk about the ethics of what we were doing and why it mattered. And not only why it mattered at that moment, why, but why it would matter for the rest of our lives. And so the, the support that gets provided um, is a support that's about ethics and accountability and sharing ideas um, and uh, doing the stuff that you're doing. But also understanding that uh, there are going to be some things that, that you've read that your colleagues might not have read. 
there's some things that you saw uh, abroad that they might not have seen, and uh, they need to hear from you on that level, and that's how you can be helpful. Um, you know, there's a premise in the question, I think, that m needs to be explored, which is that um, you're an ally rather than a full participant. And um, I, I don't know what kinds of engagements you've had, but uh, my understanding is that the movement is uh, meant to be open and is meant to be uh, fully inclusive. Uh, what's new about this movement, it's a movement that, that, you know, now I'm talking about Black Lives Matter, it's a movement not only that's meant to address itself to the wider, Amer wider American public, uh, by which I mean the wider right, white American public, but it also has kind of this internal dynamic in which it's addressing itself to the African American community as well. Um, and so the Black Lives Matter movement has really uh, focused on and uh, centered the whole question of LGBT rights in a way that we haven't had in our traditional um, African American movements in the past. Uh, and, and in that sense, it represents kind of a, you know, a new gestalt, a, a new understanding of you know, what, you know, what, in, what human rights means in the American context. And so I, I think the premise of the, uh, of the question that y your, your point of view is one of an ally um, is should is something to be examined. Yeah, you're not an ally. You're a full participant. You're in it. Yeah. If and I, let me just I, say, as a white guy that was involved in a lot of this stuff and continues to be, um, Margaret talked about systematic efforts to deny the franchise to poor people generally, and a lot of poor people happen to be people of color. Um, had the Pennsylvania legislature's effort to require IDs which you could get maybe by driving 60 miles someplace when you didn't have a license, succeed 750,000 registered voters in Pennsylvania would have been unable to vote. And in fact, the majority leader at the time said, this guarantees Romney's election, quote, unquote. Now, if you believe that, that people ought to be able to vote in this country, I don't care what your race is or your ethnic background. I mean, this is an effort that good Americans ought to be able to come together around and work at, and it's very, very important. Especially we've been looking at this presidential campaign, such as it is for the past several months. So um, not only aren't you just an ally, I mean, you and others like you have got to fully participate in this effort. And by the way, it hasn't been easy. Because we, got a, we got a Supreme Court in the United States, and, and, and uh, to me, I mean, you're the legal expert here, You both of you, uh, essentially said, well, it doesn't really make any difference even if the Congress, on a bipartisan basis, concluded that we continued to need the Voting Rights Act and had extensive hearings and, and, and made records of us. Sorry, we think, said Chief, the Chief Justice, the Voting Rights Act is unconstitutional. Uh, those ought to be fighting words for anybody who cares about this country and cares about voting rights and democracy. So there's lots to be done there. And not in a secondary road. I think that's role. Yeah. I think that's the point that Margaret was making. I mean, you should be deeply and actively involved in this stuff. And thank you for your work on Citizens United. One added point. When, we, when I look back, and we, we had a lot of pictures from, uh, that Brian brought together, photos from the uh, March on Washington. And there were 10 male leaders of that march. One of them was white. His name was Walter Ruther. He was president of the UAW. I think I mentioned his name to you. My father was his administrative assistant at the time. And I'm proud to say my father was the one who organized the UAW presence at the march. And if you look at, for example, all the signs were printed by the UAW. Yeah. And they also paid for about half the buses. So there was a way of a union leader, a white union leader, in a union which had a membership that was quite split on race. You had a lot of southern plants where you had, until quite recently, segregated facilities in the 50s. Uh, and yet here was a, a union leader who would step forward even when he was blasted by maybe a third of his membership and say,
this is our fight too. And of course, then King, in the last few years, spreads this not only to his opposition to the Vietnam War, but remember, he's assassinated when he's gone to support the sanitation workers in Memphis in a struggle for both white and black wage improvements and to be treated with dignity. So we begin to see the union movement, and Margaret talked about the early labor radicalism. Robert McCursey is here who's written whole volumes on this. Um, and the black movement really struggle together as partners. Question over here? Bob. Thanks. Uh, I'm Bob McCursey from MIT. And I want to pick up on uh, what Len has urged us to do. You know, what did we learn in the 1960s that's relevant today? And let me just sort of back up. I was heavily involved in the Chicago Civil Rights uh, Movement. In fact, almost got to Washington on a UAW airplane. It was really United Airlines. And uh, we had an engine failure. So I sat back in Chicago and watched it on uh, TV. Uh, then in 1960, uh, 60, 63. But anyway, uh, to the question, uh, it's clear from what we've uh, been seeing here tonight that the 1960s was very interracial. A lot of support uh, from the uh, white community, and this was brought out in this last uh, back and forth on the whole question about whether you're an ally or, or a member. Uh, and let me now give an example of where I don't think it's happening today. Uh, I've been involved in getting a study going in a local community between police and the community where there's a substantial uh, minority community. So in that effort, uh, we had a meeting uh, in an African-American church just uh, this past summer. And the moderator, an African-American, uh, let me just say, in the group that came to the church, about two-thirds of us were white and one-third were folks of color, African-American. So the moderator asked the question, how many of you in the audience think the police engaged in racial profiling? Not one white hand went up, and all the black hands went up. So there we are. We're not on the same page today on many issues. Where we were on the same page in the 1960s, that's as much an issue for us whites. But I think it's in, in your, in a sense, question about where are we today, and how do we all get on the same page? Anybody want to take a crack at that? <laughs> well, it's about articulating um, values that at, at base we all share. Um, you know, I've been subjected to racial profiling my whole life. Uh, first time I drove a, a, a used uh, Volvo station wagon down Huntington Avenue, I, I got about a quarter of a mile from my house and I was pulled over by a cop who wanted to know why I was driving a Volvo station wagon. Um, <laughs> you know, th th these things happen. Um, In Detroit, you'd be driving a Buick. Right. <laughs> but underneath it all, I think that... Um, uh, Folks do care about fairness um, and, and a sense of um, developing uh, some common ground uh, across communities. I just came from a, a meeting of um, uh, the city of Boston's uh, cultural planning task force. And one of the lead values that was expressed from uh, over a thousand meetings they've held around the city over the course of the summer uh, is that um, people want to see more social and cultural equity um, in the city, want to see more expression from communities that are not ordinarily heard from culturally, um, and uh, that folks are prepared to invest in that. And we happen to be in a community where that matters. I mean, we. We have a mayor, we've, we've had governors, we've, we've had several mayors, all of whom have spoken out in favor of uh, equity. The point is uh, to introduce, um, uh, I think at, at uh, a, a neighborhood level, uh, the ways of expressing that. 
and demonstrating that um, so that people start to talk to each other about what some of their common values are. I don't expect that um, uh, a white individual who believes that there's no racial profiling is suddenly going to um, see that that's the case. Unless and until a friend of theirs who is of a different color explains to them what happened when they were profiled and stopped and abused. None of us would have believed that um, a, a Harvard-educated tennis pro um, would be stopped outside a hotel in New York three weeks ago um, and, and profiled as a, a potential burglar. But we all know him. And so we're all appalled that that would have happened to him. And I think that there's, there's got to be discussion among all of us, and we all have to um, um, spend a little bit more time with friends who are different than we are, and listen to their daily stories, which are not always easy for us to tell, right? Because we don't want to feel like um, uh, we're uh, victims all the time. But to the extent that we begin to reach out beyond the circles that we tend to run in, and that goes always, um, and to listen to each other, uh, you can begin to develop some sense of uh, commonality of, uh, of value. But it's not easy. I mean, um, you know, it, it means changing some of our social circles. Uh, one of the things that shocked me most when I first came to Boston uh, was that um, had it not been for a friend of mine who was getting married um, at the, um, uh, the country club, they wouldn't have let me in the front door. And that was in the early 70s. And when I tell people that, you know, I'm always sort of a little bit um, embarrassed at the humiliation that I had to face about the prospect of not going to my friend's wedding. But the fact of the matter is, when I say that in this group, I know there are people saying, oh my God, how could that have happened? And part of the reason it happened is that we don't talk among ourselves about the humiliation that we feel when we deny the reality of some people's lives. Riots were taking place, late 60s, early 70s. Uh, it was suggested in this town that private clubs open themselves up to black kids, especially during the hot summer if they had pools. And uh, the president of the country club, we don't call it the Brooklyn country club, <laughs> was asked about this. I'll never forget this. Ben Ames Williams II, <laughs> and he said, uh, well, we'll continue the policy that we've always had, which is if a member wants to invite a guest, then we'll be happy to welcome a guest, as if the members of the country club were familiar with young black kids. <laughs> And would reach out to them and invite them to swim in the pool. <laughs> but you know, there you are. So. Uh, I mean, I just want to add one other thing. So you know, um, it takes a lot of studying, and I, this is one reason I think uh, that the, that the uh, governor and um, uh, uh, um, Barry. Barry <laughs> the governor and the professor have opened up this classroom is because it takes an enormous amount of study, not just the kinds of things that, you know, intentional uh, opening up your own circles and changing the ways in which you live your life so that you expose yourself to the diversity of our country. But, um, you know, we believe what our eyes tell us and our eyes don't tell us the truth. And so when you study, that's when you realize that your eyes are limited. What you see from here, the reality that comes this way, is not the whole reality. So let me just tell another anecdote. 
In my first year on the bench was 1977. A couple of months after that, the governor appeared on television in his wonderful s um, sweater, and uh, he told us, "Stay calm. The the uh, the uh, snowstorm is everything's going to be fine." And we all listened to him. Now, at that point, I lived in Dorchester, and I worked mostly at the Boston Municipal Court and the Roxbury District Court. Those are the co two courts to which I was assigned. All of the clientele of those courts, or most of the clientele of those courts, were African-American and Latino, and maybe a few Asians from Chinatown. But that was the clientele. And so as far as what my eyes were telling me, crime is a black problem. So then, in that February snowstorm day, because I lived in Dorchester, the local police were able to get to me. I didn't live way out in Lexington or something like that. I lived local. So they got me, and they took me to the South Boston District Court. <laughs> and I had to arrange. It was arraignment day. And I got in there, and, my, and, and I, was, I was like, shocked. Where are the black defendants? There are none. They're all white, and these guys look tough and mean, and I would not want to be in the middle of a street with any one of them after 7 o'clock at night. So, so it was a, I was completely transformed in terms of my own, and you know, I'm, I, I'm, you know, I've been around. I'm not inexperienced, but you have to, and this is, I'm really talking to the student who's out there, who's mentioned, who talked a little, well, a few moments ago. It takes years, years of study to realize what the, you know, full panoply and complexity of our realities actual that we have to deal with every day actually are. And so, you know, our job is to do the, all that study, uh, to do that work, as well as to take the steps that um, Ted has talked about. And, and I would just add one other footnote about, you know, the, the surrounding ourselves in a particular way. I go back to the anecdote I told of, of seeing a uh, black student, uh, Charlie Simmons, uh, in, in my uh, first high school uh, homeroom class and, and being shocked. The world that we live in, even here in Boston and Cambridge, the world we live in uh, looks a particular way. And, uh, you know, I'll probably get in trouble for raising this, but the fact of the matter is very few of our universities uh, have uh, people of color uh, in the upper ranks of their administration. Uh, very few of our banks or financial institutions or investment firms have people of color in their upper ranks. Very few of our nonprofit hospitals have people of color as managers in their upper ranks. Relatively few of our foundations and major nonprofits have people of color in their upper ranks. And indeed, if one were to look objectively at some of our higher education institutions, you would find that they had higher percentages of people of color 20 years ago than they do today. And the, the Globe began to explore this some months ago. And uh, one of our city councilors began to explore this some months ago, and then everyone backed off. Now, all of us are the ones who can fix that. And yet we haven't done it yet. And that's the issue that we need to deal with. There was a question or a comment way in the back. One last question. Who was it? Hey, so my name's Connor. I'm an, also a, a student here. I'm an MPA student. And my question actually kind of links back into one of the former ones um, regarding how to be a white ally. And it's almost kind of the reverse question to that, which is what do you guys think when you see, and this is for the whole panel, what do you think when you see people like Ben Carson and Herman Cain, who are kind of leaders, political leaders, very influential African-Americans, denouncing the Black Lives Matter movement and what it stands for? Do you, does that make you uneasy? Does it? What do you think? What are the consequences of that? Do you think? Well, not, just like every community, ours is a ours is a diverse community with a wide range of views, and in that sense, it's no different from any other community. And uh, so, you have had 
uh, not only Carson, but you know, some of the more established and longtime leaders uh, have uh, criticized, have been very critical of Black Lives Movement, uh, Black Lives Matter. Uh, but you know, it's here. It's and it's here to stay, uh, and it has you know captured the the uh, the zeitgeist, as it were, of uh, certainly African American young people all across the country, uh, and so it deserves to be supported. I'm a little embarrassed that uh, he graduated from the same uh, college that I did, <laughs> but but. I've always been a supporter of diversity, so I have to accept uh, his uh, ability to say what he believes, as wrong as it may be. Well, I think we've come to the end of the hour. I think the one thing we can say is, at least I don't think there's a black Donald Trump out there yet. <laughs> <laughs> but I want to thank Ed, Margaret, 